pray. Father in heaven, thank you for another opportunity to come tonight. Lord, we pray tonight as we listen in that by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit through your word that we are encouraged, that we are enlightened, and that we come away from your word of truth, right, divided, uh, edified, and then lifted up. Uh, and then, Lord Jesus, joyous, just that we can rejoice in your word from hearing your word, right, divided tonight. Lord, we pray for those who uh, are listening in that may not be saved. We want them to know that if they just believe by faith that you died, that you was buried, that you rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, that's the good news. If they just believe it by faith tonight, they will be saved from the penalty of sin. For the Bible said the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, we thank you for the good news, the gospel tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Tonight, my brothers and sisters, let's recap just a little bit uh, from last week. Edification comes from spending time in God's word, uh, rightly divided. What you will see, what we was talking about a little bit last week, when you see the affection working of the Holy Spirit in our ambassador, who spends time with God and his word. In other words, those who have been with Jesus, one thing for sure you will see and find out real soon about an ambassador that spends time with Jesus is that when a crisis strikes, they don't have to ask for time to build themselves up in the word, prayer, and faith. In other words, they don't have to ask for time to trust God. For, for they know who they serve. For they know who they believe. Those who have been with Jesus are always ready. Listen to what I said. If somebody calling on you for prayer, you don't have to duck out and go out the door. Because those who spend time with Jesus, in other words, in God's word and understanding what God is doing and then think like Christ and you're laboring with him and you stay in that doctrine, getting it on the inside. Guess what? You're always ready. They are ready to pray right and divide because they pray without ceasing. First Thessalonians 5, 17. They are there with a word right divided for the specific situation at hand because the word of God is dwelling richly in them. Colossians 3, 16. They have, they, they, they have the right verses for the situation or the circumstance at hand because they have the word of truth rightly divided in their inner man. 2 Timothy 2, 15. When those who have been with Jesus... We're doing a little recap. Sit down by the bedside of someone that's sick. They have something to offer besides the common courtesy of friendships or even the tender words of human sympathy and love. They have a word from God's own lips, rightly divided. They bring a message from the word of God for that individual's inner man. They bring words that strengthen them in their inner man. When ambassador for Christ sit down beside the mourner or the, or the bereaved or beside the bedside of the sick, they have something better than the world's cold comfort to present. They bring promises which shine like lamps in the gloom and cast their bright beams far into the gloom and depths of sorrow. They are able to tell them to live as Christ and to die as gain. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. They are able to reach and grab these scriptures and they tell those who are going through, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. For our light afflictions, oh, those are some encouraging words if you're talking to somebody that's going through. Look like folks, sometimes we come in, we go through one storm and look like we, here come another one. But when you tell them what God's word said, for our light afflictions is but for a moment. 
work it for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. But then you go on and tell them, you know what? I know you're looking at your circumstances. I know you're looking at how hard things have been down here. But guess what? Why we look not at the things which are seen. But you tell them, I want you to focus. God's word tells the focus on the things which are not seen. All your spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You focus on those. Focus on eternal life. With our loved ones, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You focus on those things. When they sit down beside the tempted those who have been tempted and tried, those who are almost fainting, they have something better to offer than human counsel or a weak human arm. They are able to give them Philippians 4, 6 through 7. This is what I say when you are ready. You got doctrine inside of you. You can tell that person that's being tried, that's being persecuted. You can say, you know what? Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer, in supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. You can tell them, talk to God about it. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. There is no power to be compared for a moment with spiritual power that comes from the effectual working of the Holy Spirit through the word of God rightly divided. Spending time with Jesus means putting him first in your life, ahead of family, friends, and yourself. When you have been with Jesus or you're spending time with God and his word, that means putting God first in all you say and do. You won't go around grumbling and complaining like Lazarus' sister Martha did during one of Jesus' visits. Let's learn something tonight for our learning and edification. Luke 10, 38 records, he says, now it came to pass, I'm reading Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now it says, now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, talking about Jesus, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha, she was cumbered. In other words, Martha was worried about much serving and, and, and came to him and said, Lord, Martin in the kitchen trying to get things together while Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. She said, Lord, dost thou care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she come and help me. She told him, you tell Martha, Jesus, Jesus, tell, Martha, tell Mary to come help me in the kitchen, get things together. Martha wanted Mary to get in the kitchen and help her. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but the one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part. How many of you have chosen the good part tonight, which shall not be taken away from her? God's word is eternal. The good part. My brothers and sisters, it is not important who you are, what profession you hold, how much education you have, or what possessions you own, because the only thing that will truly affect the heart of others is the gospel. The more someone spend time with Jesus, in other words, the word of truth right divide, the more that person becomes like Christ. But so many folks are like Martha. They concern about things that doesn't matter. They are worried and anxious about things that doesn't matter. You become like Christ in purity, holiness, and love. In turn, his pure walk produces in him a great boldness for God. That's what you get. Scripture says the wicked flee 
when no man pursue it, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Proverbs 28, 1. The word for bold in this verse in Proverbs 28, 1 means secure, confident. The kind of boldness which with we see from Apostle Paul in the dispensation of grace. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, 1 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, he said, but even after that, we, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Paul says we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God. Then a few verses later, the apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, the apostle Paul makes clear, we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherishes her children. Those who spend time with God and God's word become assured. That's why they are unafraid to speak the truth. Yet they don't have to deliver their message in an overburned voice. In every circumstance, they preach the gospel in love and in mercy. Paul says in Romans 1.16, he said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believe it. He said to the Jew first and also to the Greek. When you have been with Jesus, or when you have been spending time in this wonderful book called the Holy Bible, then your actions will have a God effect on people. Have you ever noticed? Does your actions have a God effect on people? Or does pe do people look at you and say, law, law, I don't want to be like that. If that's a Christian, I don't want to be like that. Or do you have a godly effect on people? You will be criticized. And some people may even put you down. But many times that's because they are jealous of you. Folks get jealous when some folks, those who study and get doctrine on the sins inside. And they can recall it. They want to put you down. Criticize you. Make you quit. Want to make you quit. You have to have true godliness, but they have only man's fake godliness. It's fake. 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, Yea, and all, there's some verse my wife and I always share together, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You see where the persecution come from? Look at the verse. It comes from when you live godly in Christ Jesus. You see that? Paul was one of the worst persecutors of Christians, but he became one of the persecuted when he became just like Jesus. When folks realized that Paul, in other words, had been with Jesus, and what I mean became like Jesus. He began to think like Christ, do things Christ's way, and labor with Christ is what he's doing. Of the Jews, Paul said, five times receive I for the stripes, save one. He said, thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice was I suffered shipwrecked, a night and day. I have been in the deep and journeys often in pearls of water, in pearls of robbers, in pearls by my own countrymen, in pearls by the heathens, in pearls in the city, in pearls in the wilderness, in pearls in the sea, in pearls among false brothers, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and in thirst and fasting also. Fast and often in cold and nakedness. That's 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 27. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 27. Apostle Paul gave himself completely to Jesus. And he let nothing stop him. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. 
and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 The gospel presented and the word of God right divided shared with them will either stir them up when you're dealing with folks to believe or cause them to fight against you. If they want to fight when you're standing out there as an ambassador for Christ, if they want to fight, just give, give glory to God and continue to do the work of the ministry. If they want to put you down, if they want to persecute you, you just continue to do the work of the Lord and do the work of the ministry as his ambassador. Yes, many will be astonished at you, at your doctrine, because it is Christ's doctrine right divide, rightly divided. At the authority, they'll be astonished at the authority with which you speak. The boldness that you have. It's not you. It's the affection working of the Holy Spirit through the word of God. They'll be astonished at your wisdom and at the works you are doing as an ambassador for Christ. They will be astonished at your understanding, your answers, and your knowledge of the Bible. They will be amazed at the godly contentment you have. But godliness with contentment is great gain. 1 Timothy 6.6 6. 1 Timothy 6.6 6. Those who spend time with Jesus can't get enough of him. Let me say that again. Those who spend time with Jesus they can't get enough of him. Their hearts continue to cry out to know our Savior. Better to draw closer to him to grow in the knowledge of his ways. Philippians stuff. Philippians chapter 3, 12, 14, Paul said, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I followed after if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He said, brethren, I count not myself to apprehend, but this one thing, said Paul, this one thing I do, Paul said. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Paul said, look at this now. Get your fruit tonight from God's word. Get your fruit now. Get your fruit from God's word right in the Bible. Paul said, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Here Paul acknowledged years after his salvation that he had not yet gotten a grasp of just why Jesus Christ saved him. He knew he had to experience more spiritual growth. He had more to learn from God's word to come to a further understanding of God's overall plan for the heaven and the earth and his role in that plan. Paul never turned return to vain religion and spiritual ignorance. He forgot those things which were behind and reached forth to those things which are before so that he could come to a greater spiritual maturity. He focused on a goal, in other words, a mark, and that goal was to win the prize, to understand the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Again, Paul wanted to know God better and better so he could know what God was doing and then better understand his role in what God was doing. Paul gained this understanding by studying the Bible and letting the indwelling Holy Spirit use it to work in him for God's glory. We do the same, my brothers and sisters. There are many who may have physical power, worldly influence, as well as influence in the church, the body of Christ, and prestige, and, 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 and cannot comfort a mourner. You hear me? They can't even comfort someone that's going through. They might have world influence, physical power, and they might have influence in the church, the body of Christ. They might have prestige, but guess, guess what? They can't even comfort someone that need comforting. Nor dry tear nor lift up a fainting one. They can't even do those things. 
They can't, they can't lead a lost soul to salvation by presenting the gospel to, of their salvation. The achievement of physical power will perish. The things that mighty men do will pass away. The cities men build will crumble. The throne men array, the throne men raise will topple and fall. But the things wrought by the spiritual power of God and his everlasting word will endure forever. The boldness and the spiritual power to speak as an ambassador for Christ can be obtained only in one way. Wealth will not give it. The universities cannot confer it. Genius has nothing among his treasures. It is not gotten in military academies. It is not one of the jewels of the king's crowns. It can only be had by being much with Jesus. And that means spending time with God and his word, walking in it and living it. We have to live with him, commune with him, sit at his feet, lie at his bosom. That's what spending time with Jesus means. And you will be clothed with spiritual power that only God's word right in the body can give. Satan's evil world system, indeed, he attempts to stifle that doctrine that you have. No one enjoys it more when we oppose ourselves than Satan himself. He knows that the key to thwarting our edification lies in our attitude and approach towards the word of God. His policy of evil against us dedicates itself to corrupting how we ought to think. However, like a soldier who captured a position without firing a shot, so Satan has no struggle whatsoever with a Christian who readily cooperates with how he wants them, him to think. He walks right into the snare of the devil, and Satan easily fulfills his desire of keeping him from being edified. So many of them walk right into the snares of the devil today. And they are so much, they are so deceived. When we oppose ourselves, we truly are our own worst enemy. The Apostle Paul warned of the perilous times in the body of Christ, the grace movement. It is under vicious attack. One fundamental role of a Christian ministry is to address controversial matters when they become recurrent and problematic. That's why right division is so important and maturing in the faith. We cannot expect to be about our Heavenly Father. We are when we are ignorant, in other words, have been taught of the very things that hinder it. In spite of the ensuing backlash, we must discuss problems and issues we see in the body of Christ. Whatever the cost, certainly none of us are sinless. There is more irresponsibility activity in the Grace Church than at the denominational ones. It is a sad commentary, brothers, but we Grace people often discredit and condemn ourselves. We are frequently a threat to our own belief system. And that established precisely this study uh, uncomfortable theme how we can become our own worst enemy because we don't spend time in God's word my brothers and sisters we have become our worst enemy few things can be more foolish than to stand in your own way so usually we are ignorant that we, in other words, that have been taught that we are doing this, not realizing that we have been deceiving and thinking that what we are doing is really beneficial. Man, sometimes that's why how Satan got those already, the children of disobedience. Just think of a drug dealer that's selling drugs, selling their death to people out on the street. Guess what? They, they, they sold the seed that, you know, because the money coming in, that what they don't see what it's doing, not only to them, but to others. All they're concerned about is that the money keep rolling in. 
They're not concerned that folks are dying, overdosing, things like that. My brothers and sisters, and Satan convinced them, oh, there's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, and he's doing that today to saints in the body of Christ. No, you got, you got enough time. You ain't got to be in that Bible all the time. You need time for yourself. You need to take a little time. Don't worry about that word. You can get it tomorrow. You can get it next week. Yes. However, to oppose ourselves in any endeavor is not only foolish, it is serious. Not only do we hinder our ability to make progress, we actually assure that no progress can be made until we change our minds. When we oppose ourselves, we are ensnared in a trap of our own making, and we remain ensnared until we stop opposing ourselves. Hence, as the expression rightly said, when we oppose ourselves, we are our worst enemy we could possibly have. It would be bad enough if opposing ourselves was something limited to just the affairs of his life, but it's not. Unfortunately, it is a common Christian affliction. We have a tendency to think that self-deceit and self-opposition would be a trait of the unsaved, as in Acts 18.6, where the unbelieving Jews, Acts 18.6, where these unbelieving Jews oppose themselves and blaspheme. However, it should not come as a surprise to us that a Christian can also be also deceive himself, oppose himself, and so hinder his edification. Paul encountered it frequently throughout his ministry, and we find him dealing with examples of it in our epistle. For example, Paul said, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seeming to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. 1 Corinthians 3.18. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Galatians 6.3. My brothers and sisters, when I was new to write the vision, I could sense something odd among many things that were going on in church the body of Christ. I was not spiritually mature enough at the time, but now I can look back and realize what was actually going on. I encountered, I encountered this is what you get, one crowd of grace believers, a group of preachers and saints who have been in the ministry for 20, 40 years. I also met another crowd of grace believers a second group of pastors, preachers, and saints who have been in the grace ministry for just as long. Both groups are passionately, they, they passionately defend Christ's finished cross work as sufficient payment for their sins. Both stood on the King James Bible. Both hold to Paul's unique apostleship. Both, both know we are not Israel, but the church, the body of Christ, and so on. Yet, as I take notice, of these groups today, I noticed something radically different. One group maintained outlandish behavior. This is what Paul is talking about. When you start seeing those who turn their ears away from the truth, and they they have they turn outlandish behavior and behave quite worldly. They are shockingly immature. The other group is more stable in their doctrine. Seeming to have more sense and morals as touching Christian living. How could both groups hold the same core principles and yet wind up so diametrically dissimilar? All those years I was unable to answer that question. But now years later by the fiction working of the Holy Spirit through the word of God, I understand what I was witnessing and is witnessing and how it has whacked worse today in the body of Christ, the church, as in the denominational circle, so it is in the grace circles. Apostle Paul allowed us to see the landscape as to what the body of Christ would look like in the last days in the dispensation of grace. A good many grace people are grace in name only. Watch out now, preacher. Wait a minute. A good many grace people are grace in name only. They really have no interest in letting God's grace teach them how to live. 
They are shallow in their understanding of the scripture, but they have just enough facts to pass them off as grace people instead of the denominational individual. While identifying as grace believers, they are just as superficial in the scriptures as the denominations they censor. They have the right doctrine and yet still manage to be equally immature in the word of God. The word of God is not the problem. They are the problem. They have quenched the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, and thereby grieved him, Ephesians 4, 30. My brothers and sisters, we're going to pick this up next week. The Holy Spirit cannot renew our minds when we are too busy entertaining nonsensical ideas. He cannot transform our lives when we are too entangled in childish desires. Don't fool yourself in assuming that grace people would be the most willing of all people to learn the truth of God's word right about it. Don't fool yourself. We'll stop right there. My brothers and sisters, let us pray. Father, here we thank you for your word tonight. We pray as those who listen in, that they were encouraged, that they were enlightened. And Lord, that your word, by the fiction working on the Holy Spirit, let that doctrine get on the inside. Lord, And we pray that those who do not spend time in your word, that they would want to have a desire to get in your word and study it rightly divided so they can know the power, the spiritual power they can have when they put that, 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 that gospel and then they put that doctrine they put that good news, they put, they, they, they allow the effects working on the Holy Spirit to take that doctrine and use it and make them bold to stand as ambassador for Christ in this sin cursed world. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.